Hey, what's up everybody? This is Caroline. Welcome back to part six of Beginning Metal. Games would be really boring if we just used plain colors for all the scene models. So in this video, we'll see how to add textures to models. Textures are objects that contain image data. We can render to textures and we can use textures on models to change the color or the surface properties of the model. At the end of this video, our quad model will have a picture of this good-looking guy textured on it. We'll also look at smoothing the picture so that it's not pixelated. In this example, we have an elongated quad and we're going to apply a square texture. We have to match the vertices of the triangles to points on the texture. In our vertex structure, we currently have the vertex position and the vertex color. We'll add information to this vertex structure for the texture coordinates. So let's see how the texture coordinates match the vertex coordinates. On the left is our current quad made up of two triangles. And on the right is a texture showing the texture coordinates. These are generally referred to as UV coordinates, distinguishing them from the vertex XYZ coordinates. When you come to modeling later, you'll map the vertex coordinates to the texture coordinates using a UV map. In the vertices array here, we match each texture coordinate to the appropriate vertex coordinate. I'm only showing the top left and bottom left coordinates in the array here. So the top left vertex zero matches the top left corner of the texture and the bottom left vertex one matches the bottom left corner of the texture. You'll notice that we're using normalized coordinates for all these. By normalized, I mean values between minus one and plus one. The size of your image is irrelevant. In this example, the top left corner will always match the top left of the texture and the bottom left corner will always match the bottom left of the texture, no matter how large or small your image texture is. Just as with the colored vertices, the rasterizer will interpolate the part of the texture to use for each fragment. And in this case, the texture will stretch. This is how you texture more complex models by creating a UV map. Your modeling app will help you unwrap all the vertices of the model and convert your three-dimensional model into the two dimensions needed for the two-dimensional texture. You then paint a texture matching the color and the vertices. On the texture, you can see the fish's face section and a separate fin section that's yellow. I've highlighted the eye vertices and the matching vertices on the model on the right are also highlighted. If I move the selected eye vertices to the red dots at the top of the texture, that changes the UV mapping, and the textured eyes on the model update to the two red dots. So by moving vertices to match texture points, you have complete control over which part of the texture the vertices are mapped to. Of course, we'll have to update our vertex array and descriptor the vertex function and fragment functions to handle the texture information. The vertex function will pass on the texture coordinate to the fragment function, just as it did for the color. On the Swift side, we'll load the texture from the image using MTK Texture Loader, then load a metal fragment buffer with the texture. The fragment function will receive texture buffer zero as a parameter, and sample the texture at the fragment location and return the color of the texture at that point. Here we're using a default sampler state, but let's have a look at this sampler in more detail. The sampler state tells the GPU how to use the texture. Just like building a pipeline state, we build the sampler state using an MTL sampler descriptor and then describe its properties. The filtering mode describes how the missing pixels are filled when you resize an image. This can be either linear or nearest. When you make an image bigger, 
If it's a photo, you want the missing pixels to be averaged from neighboring pixels. This smooths the missing data. This filtering mode is linear. However, if you're doing pixel art, you probably want to repeat pixels, and this filtering mode is nearest. MIP mapping is useful for level of detail. MIP maps are images of different, differing sizes. If your model is at the front of the scene, you probably want a detailed, smooth texture, and if that texture is at the back of the scene, you might get unwanted artifacts when the image is resized. The sampler state has properties where you can set the filtering mode for resizing between MIP map levels. We've addressed our texture coordinates using values between 0 and 1, but you can map outside 0 and 1, and the sampler state has properties where you can describe what happens outside those limits. You might just repeat the edge of the texture or repeat the whole texture. So let's texture your quad with this happy zombie image in the demo. We'll create a texturable protocol with a default texture loading method that our quad will conform to and create a new fragment function to apply the texture. We'll then create a sampler state and smooth the stretched pixelated image. So here's where we left off last time. We have this grayscale quad that we're going to texture. The first thing I'm going to do is drag in some images from the resources. There, I have three images here, the zombie and two images that you'll use in the challenge. There will be various types of model that will be texturable and the texturing process for each will be the same. So I'm going to create a protocol with a default protocol extension. I'll create a new file and call it Texturable and create a protocol called Texturable. Each model will need a texture property and that'll be a metal texture. And now I'll create an extension with a temporary texture loading method inside it. I'll come back and fill this method out later. I'll now conform plain to texturable. And add the texture property to plain. I'm going to copy the initializer to receive an image name so I can create a texture from it. And I'll load the texture property. Here I'm calling the protocol extension method in texturable. Currently I'm just returning nil from that method, but in a moment I'll go and complete it. Now we have to add the texture coordinates to the vertices. There are several things we'll have to change here. First, I'll have to change the vertex struct. And then I'll have to update the vertex array. And then the vertex descriptor. And on the shader side, I'll need to add the texture coordinates to the structs and change the vertex function so that it sends the texture coordinates to the rasterizer. And finally, I'll create a new fragment function that will take in the texture as a parameter. So first, I'll add the texture to the vertex struct in types. And now update the vertices array. Here I've added the texture information to the position and color information, and the index information still stays the same. Now I'll add the texture information to the vertex descriptor. <laughs> 
Here I've set the offset so that the texture attribute is offset by the size of the first two entries. In the fragment function, let me remove the grayscale challenge code. And build and run to make sure everything works so far. Notice that the vertex function still works, even though I've added a new texture entry to the Swift struct and I haven't updated the GPU's vertex in struct accordingly. This is an important advantage of using the stage in attribute in the vertex function. If I was still accessing the buffer zero vertices array, I'd have to make sure all my data was correctly aligned between the Swift struct and the vertex function struct. In shader.metal, I'll add the texture data to the vertex in and vertex out structs. And change the vertex function so that the data gets transferred across to vertex out. Now that I've set up the data structure, I'll need to write the code in texturable to load the image into a metal texture. M metal Kit Texture Loader class makes this fairly easy for us. So first I'll create the texture loader and now I'll start loading up the texture. iOS 10 changed whether the texture loads from the bottom left or the top left so I'll create some options to check whether we're running iOS 10. and load the texture using the passed in image name and do the actual texture loading and finally return the texture so now we have a metal texture I want to send this to the GPU in the render method so back in plane find the draw method so here I tell the command encoder to set the fragment texture at the fragment index buffer 0 because we're going to be rendering a texture instead of just a plain color I'll need to create a new fragment function in shader.metal I'll create that function to receive the texture. The second parameter here is the texture in fragment buffer 0. I'll use a default sampler state and extract the color from the current fragment's texture coordinates. So there's a new fragment function to deal with textured models. We want the GPU to use this fragment function for textured models and that means that the pipeline state needs to have the correct fun fragment function in it. So I'll go back to planes initializer and update the pipeline so that it will use this fragment function. Now I need to change the game scene to call this initializer. And build and run. And there's our party zombie. You'll notice it's a bit pixelated. The default sampler uses the filtering mode nearest. So I'll create a sampler state that will change this to linear. I'll do this in renderer so that all our textured models will use the same sampler state. First I'll create a sampler property and then build the sampler state in a new method. Here I've set the resizing mode to linear. 
I'll call this method from the initializer. And in the draw method, add the sampler state to the command encoder at sampler state buffer index 0. Now I'll change the fragment function to receive this sampler as a parameter. And I'll use this sampler instead of the default sampler. And build and run. And the party zombie isn't as pixelated anymore. It's still slightly pixelated because it's a very small image stretched onto quite a large screen. Your challenge for this video tutorial is to mask out the zombie with a circular masking image. You'll also create a second quad with a picture frame image to frame our zombie. You'll find full details in the accompanying challenge document. And that's it for this video tutorial. In the next video, we'll move from two dimensions to the third dimension. I hope you enjoyed this video tutorial. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.